Hi, this is Pastor John coming to you from the Meditation Gardens here at the Gender Road Christian Church, and I'm glad that you've chosen to take the time to, to watch and participate in the message that God has for you today. One of the ways that you can do that is definitely follow along in your Bible, read the Scripture, pray that the Holy Spirit helps you understand it in a new way. So let's get started. God, thank you that we can come together and, and just the, the sounds of, of family and talking and worshiping, Lord, we receive the joy and fullness that you give to us. And so we open our hearts to you, Lord, and we know that you will fill us with the bread of life. Amen. The lectionary scripture for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, and it deals with the story of the Good Samaritan. And a lot of us have heard the story of the Good Samaritan, but just in case you haven't, we're going to cover it fairly in depth today. And of course, what we hear in scripture and as we, when we come to church, we don't come to church without being um, familiar with our own context, without being familiar with what we've experienced during the week, whether we're retired or working. And the events of this week um, on, you know, have shocked the nation. And um, we, you know, we've seen where the social media and the news outlets were uh, on fire with, with two people that were killed. Um, uh, while dealing with the police, and then we had the Dallas ambush. And when all that happens, it shocks us. It should shock us. It should make us sad. It should make us hurt because we see our country hurting. We see our fellow brother and sister in Christ hurting. And so when we come to church, there's always that blend of how do we deal with that, um, and so this story, again, in God's own timing, is very appropriate as we discuss what does it mean to be a neighbor? Who is my neighbor? How does God ask me to love another? And so we'll get into that. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to talk about some things, and we're not taking sides on anything. But as a Christian, we have to ask questions. It's the only way we get answers. And, of course, when all this happens... Um, we, we wonder what is going on with, with our relations and the fear and the violence that goes in the world. And I know we have at least two police officers that come here, and I think of them and their families and pray for them uh, and their safety as well. And so that, that weighs on, on my mind, and I see a lot of my clergy friends and peers that will uh, be pretty uh, prolific on social media with their thoughts and opinions and so forth. Um, and, and, and a lot of you have been trying to deal with, and how, how do we respond to this? You know, what does my faith want me to do? What does God want me to do? How do we react? And, you know, we all come to this um, in, in different ways because we're all different ages, right? And so we've grown up in a different America uh, in, in which values things a little bit differently and what was okay you know, what's okay today was never okay in the 40s and 50s and 60s when a lot of you um, were, were alive and living and so forth. So that, how we experiencing things today, you know, impacts us differently. And um, so we're going to talk about that today. And so I just wanted you to, to know that we're going to read this. I'll read the text to you, and then I'll take any questions that you might have about, you know, from the first reading of the text and then as you kind of have a chance to think through it or read it on your own in, in the Pew Bible or if you brought your own Bible, you can text me questions uh, like we've done before and I will try to address those, okay? So it comes from the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And there's really kind of two, we, the scripture starts out and it's in two segments. One, there is a lawyer or a scribe, someone that was well-versed in the Mosaic Law, and he is asking Jesus a question. And we sort of get the opinion that he's just not asking a neutral question, but in a way that is trying to test Jesus or maybe even trick Jesus. So just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so that's where this first part is dealing with, a sort of a theological discussion. What is eternal life? What must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor 
as yourself. And so he is quoting um, from Deuteronomy and Leviticus here in terms of what the Torah, known as the way of life, um, would require. And in verse 28, and Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer, do this, do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And so now we get into the second part where Jesus then takes us into a real life situation that speaks directly to us today. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. And he went to him and bandaged his wounds, and having poured oil and wine on them, then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Jesus said, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And he said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. So we have some characters in here, right? What characters did we or people are involved with the story? We have the lawyer, the robbers, priest. Levite, Samaritan, okay, and keeper, yep, the victim, yep, okay. Initial questions that you may have about the story. Let's go ahead and raise your hand. You can ask your question, and I'll try to repeat it so everybody can um, might might know. Yes. So wasn't it a rule at that time that the priest was not supposed to touch a dead body? So we don't know why the Levite or the, the priest didn't go over to the person, right? They saw him, but they passed by. They didn't go near. They went around the other side, and they didn't touch. And we don't know why. The scripture doesn't say. So we can surmise, we can try to guess, maybe they were on their way to a worship service and he did not want to become ritually unclean. Maybe there was something important they needed to do. Or maybe they were fearful for their own life because they were on a dangerous road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And so maybe they thought it was a trap, right? The guy's laying there acting like he's hurt and then when they go over to help him, they too would be robbed. We don't know. What's a Levite? Levite is a priest type, one of the um, those who would work in the temple. That is a Levite. So they were sort of of the clergy ordained type, kind of like me. Yes. So why did Jesus use two clergy types and then a Samaritan? What do we know about Samaritans? Nobody liked them. They were mixed breeds. So the Samaritans, there was animosity generally between the Jews and the Samaritans because um, years and years and years before, um, they tried to follow the same faith, but they had their own scriptures, and there was disagreement, and then they went their own way, and so there was um, just animosity between those two. So why, did, why would Jesus use in this example two? 
um, which that really gets into the essence of the story, which starts to get at um, who do we consider to be our neighbor? Do we hold fast to a creed? Do we hold fast to cultural norms? Do we hold fast to what's maybe acceptable in society? Or are we willing to be vulnerable um, and, and move past prejudices or past um, tribe, clan, nation, race, and show love and compassion? So, and I'll come back to the, maybe the other real zinger point of that as well. So, yeah, Tom. So Tom's question is, wasn't this a time where Jesus was trying to bridge a gap between the old Mosaic law and what might be considered Jesus' new law? So we want to watch what terms we use because the Mosaic law or, or, or the Torah was the first five books of the Old Testament. That was still in place because Torah is the, means the way of life. And Jesus says, I do not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill and uphold the law. And so when Jesus gave the new commandment that you love each other, um, it was really upholding the law. Now, what Jesus is trying to show is those that are self-righteous or try to justify themselves, um, because what the scribe was trying to, the lawyer slash scribe, a Levite, or not the Levite, but the lawyer slash scribe, what he was trying to do was justify himself in order to limit who he had to love, who was his neighbor. Because, you know, I really love all of you in this section, and so you're my neighbor, so I'm going to do whatever for you. But, you know, you guys over there, well, you're in that section. Other questions? So, We've kind of covered the basis of that a little bit, and so now what we'll do is have a chance to think about that, to pray over the scripture, and we'll come back into it. So if you have other questions that you want to ask or whatever, text in. And again, I won't you know, say who asked the question or whatever, but we'll try to address that through the rest of the message. Okay, Pastor Torito. So we have a few questions that are uh, coming in and you know, so this has really been weighing on my heart in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we address this? Because there's a lot that goes on, and, and, and we have issues in our society that have been dealt with, and some have been dealt with by laws, but um, Martin Luther King Jr. helps us understand that um, laws won't change a person's heart. They may stop or restrain the heartless, but it's only when we follow God's love, will that begin to unite the hearts and minds of all humans and real help us realize that we're all made in God's image. And so the story comes to us, the scripture comes to us in the context of what has been happening in the world. And we have a lot of people that, you know, give their opinions and so forth on the social media, but it's a dangerous road. The Samaritan was on a dangerous road. We don't know why the priests and Levite were on a dangerous road, but we're all on a dangerous road. Maybe you can remember a time in your life where you wonder, how did I get here? This is not where I want to be. I was um, 22 years old, and I was driving through New York City on the East Coast, and was working for a job then where I, I traveled and had everything in my car. And my car started breaking down about 10 o'clock at night going through New York City. I was just a farm boy from Ohio. I was scared to death because I figured if I had to leave my car, I wouldn't come back to the car or the car would be a shell of everything that was in it. It's a dangerous road. A dangerous road going from David's city of peace, perched high on a hill 20 miles down, 3,000 feet difference through the wilderness or 
gangs of bandits were there and they robbed. But we start to see what does it mean to be a neighbor. So let's read this text again. So just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. You see, he's quoting Deuteronomy there, 6, 5. And he also comes in with Leviticus 19, 18 at the very end where he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself because Leviticus 19, 18 says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord your God. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied that a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, and when he came to that place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Passed by on the other side of that dangerous road. But a Samaritan while traveling, came near him. You see, this really got the audience right here. This was provocative. It was shocking. What do you mean, one of our own, the good people didn't stop and help him? And now you're saying the Samaritan, who's really no good, you're saying he is stopping to help? Verse 35, the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I'll repay you whatever more you spend. You see, a lot of times when we hear the story of the Good Samaritan, it's kind of a warm, fuzzy story about how we should be nice to people, about maybe how we welcome strangers, but it really gets into a lot more than that, and it gets to the heart of the issue of what we're dealing with today. Because the lawyer couldn't even name it. Because Jesus said, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Go and do. Jesus says a lot, go and do, go and do. But you see, he couldn't even name it. Because if he liked somebody, he would say, yeah, George showed him a lot of mercy. He's the one who helped him. No, don't make me name the person that I don't like. Don't make me name this group which whom I despise. We deal with this in America. We don't really want to a lot. We see everything out there. We're not picking sides but we have to be in conversation about this because what the scripture does is it forces us to get by just some admonitions on how we should treat each other to get into the very heart of self-examination about what am I still harboring inside of me that is racist? What am I still harboring inside of me that is um, prejudicial in views? What am I still dealing with? And that's only can be done by you examining yourself based on what Jesus is saying to us in terms of loving your neighbor because that's what shocked the people. It shocked the people when Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. No one expected that the king of the world, the savior of the world, would be crucified. Yet God shows up where we least expect God to show up. And this And and when it talks about showing compassion in the gospel of Luke, there's three times it happens. The prodigal son, Jesus, and here. The Samaritan is functioning as an agent of God and showing compassion. And we are to go and do likewise, which gets past color, race, nation, tribe. Helping somebody in need showing love, seeing them. Because otherwise, what happens is if we see something other than how God wants us to see our fellow brother and sister in Christ, we see something that isn't their humanness. We see them as a thing. We see them as an entity. We see them as an object. We see them as they, the other. But 
He wanted to limit. We talked about this. The strategy of self-vindication. Well, you know, I'm pretty good. I, you know, I could just love who I really want to, and won't that be enough? No, it's not. There's a biblical scholar named Amy Jill Levine, and she is a, um, teaches at the Disciples Vanderbilt Seminary. And she says this to help us bring into context this story of the Samaritan. To hear this parable in contemporary terms, she writes, we should think of ourselves as the person in the ditch and then ask, is there anyone from any group about whom we'd rather die than acknowledge she offered me help or he showed me compassion? Or is there any group whose members might rather die than help us? If so, then we know how to find the modern equivalent for the Samaritan. You see, the Good Samaritan offered some one-time help, brought relief to this person. But then what do we do that gets into the issues that cause the person to be robbed in the first place? So if we start looking at the root causes then, why was the road to Jericho so dangerous? You see, what rises up inside a lot of people when we hear and have witnessed the events of this past week deals with issues of fear. We try to detach ourselves. But in the story, we see where the Good Samaritan drew near because when he draws near, he makes himself vulnerable. He becomes involved with that person's pain, agony, misery, oppression, becomes involved with that story. And there's vulnerability when you do that. But drawing near to somebody means that we also are willing to listen. A lot of times we all want to talk, but there's not a lot of listening. And so when we see things about Black Lives Matter or this group or that group, it can start to rise stuff inside of us. And I'm not saying which way of anything, but I think what it means is as Christians, when we see that, how do we respond? Because there's a lot of people in the world that respond in no way that is in God's love. But as Christians, we have that choice. This is what it gets at a little bit when it says we must take up our cross. What are we willing to do to listen, to talk, to understand, to make a difference? How do we talk about it with our kids, our grandkids? What are we willing to do to make sure there is a safe place for people to go, for ways that people can participate in activities? Because it's a dangerous road out there, and there's always a chance that someday we might be lying in that ditch. Can we even name it? Can we even name it? You see, Jesus' cross and resurrection, the forgiveness of sin, is also about God's promise to enter into our chaos, enter into our fear, stand with us through all that frightens us, and reminds us that God will not abandon us, and that God will bring us to that eternal life on the other side. The antidote to fear isn't power or weapons, it's courage, compassion, trust, acting our faith in love. We spend a lot of time and energy in our lives detached, disengaged, disenfranchised. We figure, you know what, we'll let somebody else deal with that. But maybe now's a time where we don't have the luxury to let somebody else deal with that. Maybe now's a time where we don't have the luxury to pass by on the other side. Are we willing to be courageous and vulnerable to draw near to those who are hurting? to be in that discussion. One of the questions texted in is, in light of what just happened here, how do we react in love when so much fear has been instilled in us with recent events? Jesus told us to be wise, but innocent as doves. And so we have to prepare, we have to plan. There's a lot of legitimate reasons to be afraid and fearful. But that isn't what controls our life. It's our, it's our faith that comes into that. 
Another question that came in said, justifying ourselves, we do this daily, living up to the Good Samaritan standard in today's it's all about me society. How can we do that? I don't know so much about living up to a standard of the Good Samaritan. Again, this isn't a moralistic story to make you feel guilty about anything. It's more of a challenge that Jesus gives to us, go and do likewise. It's a journey on the road that we come across people, how do we respond in love? And some days we do that better than others. Which is why we have that saying, today's the day the Lord has made. Every day is a new day, and you have that choice. It's responding in love. And sometimes responding means that we don't lash out in fear or with words that hate or with words that cause concern. A while ago, I was with friends and um, we were watching TV and an African-American newscaster came on the screen filling in. And somebody in the room said, well, if he's going to be on there all the time, I'm switching stations. Really? It happens today and it impacts our thinking and it doesn't allow us to see each other as children of God. Decreasing our nearness, decreasing that space that's between other people and us helps us begin to fix the road that causes the person to be robbed in the first place. It's small steps that deal with changing our thought patterns. It begins daily with transformation about giving who we are. Because you see, God knows you, the best parts of you and the worst parts of you. Do you go to God with that? and say, I need help in those areas. Those begin the steps of transformation that helps us be a light in the world. Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick talks about enforceable and unenforceable laws. Enforceable laws, those are the thousands of laws we have on the law books. Unenforceable laws are those that concern our inner attitudes, he writes, genuine person-to-person -person relationships and expressions of compassion which the law books cannot regulate. Man-made laws, we hope, ensure justice, but God's higher law produces love. A good person, a loving person, is obedient to the unenforceable that is operating within them. The laws of humankind cannot bring an end to fears, prejudice, pride, and irrationality, which are the barriers to a society that is integrated, equal, one, civil, and neighborly. Mark, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote back in 1962, the true neighbor will risk his or her position, his prestige, even his life for the welfare of others in the dangerous valleys and hazardous pathways. He will lift some bruised and beaten person to a higher and more noble life. What are we doing? How are we putting our faith into action? There's no easy answers out there. But coming together as a church, being willing to talk about it, having conversations allows us to understand, allows us to then take that out into the world and be in conversation and understanding. Putting our faith into action, it allows you and your own spiritual disciplines and your own private times of prayer at home to take these issues to God and say, you know what, I'm wrestling with this. You know what, God, when I see this written, when I hear people say this, when I see this on TV, God, it makes me mad. It raises something up inside me. What do I do with that? That's part of journeying. That's part of spiritual maturity. That's part of being on a road of transformation that God is working inside all of us. You see, the story gives us a promise that God is going to show up and work through. And the question was asked before about why was a Samaritan chosen? The Samaritan was chosen because if we're unwilling to see God at work in the lives of others, then we miss God at work in our life because we limit ourselves. If we think that God is just going to work in this section right here because you're all so good looking, right? Then we don't think God's going to be working over there. But God does. 
And that's sometimes surprising for us and shocking for us that God's going to choose not just someone we like or love, but maybe even someone we don't like or maybe even our enemy. Yeah. Amen. I love being outside and being surrounded by God's creation. And I pray that today's message has been a blessing in your life. And I look forward to hearing from you or someday being able to speak with you about how God has been part of your life today.